The history of Florida as a Confederate state is a fascinating one. Basically, it had only recently, a couple of decades prior, gained independence and only gained independence from Spain in 1821. And so there was a very small population, but the population that did live there was either of the slave class or generally of the plantation class, because at least areas around Tallahassee and the Florida Panhandle were referred to as cotton kingdoms, and half of the state's population of about 140,000 were enslaved Africans. Africans. And so when the Civil War came along, they were only able to muster a regular army of about 15,000. And this army, therefore, was engaged in very, very few battles. And the Union realized that it would be very easy to take a number of very important forts along the coast, such as St. Augustine and Key West, and to blockade Florida. However, it was very important as a resource because people, especially the Confederates, they would be blockade runners and they would go into the narrow bays and basically escape into the bayou. So throughout the war, Florida had this image of a sort of kind of backwater bushwhacking territory that was ostensibly part of the Confederacy, but mostly controlled by the Union. Now, the interior areas of the state are more where the regular army was active. So the Union could operate pretty freely along the coast and especially in the naval waters. But in the interior, the, the Union was sort of afraid to venture. Now, in 1864, on February 20th, a Union general against orders, against his own country, country's orders marched from Jacksonville and tried to march straight through the center of Florida to Tallahassee, the Florida capital and the capital of the Confederacy. Now, this is also because it was a very politically important spot because it was right next to Leon County, which is where a lot of plantations were. And the plan was essentially probably something akin to Sherman's march to the sea. He was going to cut right through and sort of take back these plantations. In the same time, you had a lot of Africans, because it was half African, joining the Colored Corps, joining the United States Navy. They were all trying to defect and gain their freedom. And they met the Confederates at a place called Olusti. And this is the main battle. The Battle of Alusti was the main battle in Florida. And it was 5,500 Union troops versus 5,000 Confederates. And the general from Jacksonville, the Union general, was operating under the assumption that the Confederates were just a ragtag group of rebels. Now, they were, but they were able to rout them using their knowledge of the terrain, which was at the time, even though it's depicted as a flat open field in most woodcuts, it was a very you know heavily forested, swampy area. And the Confederates were able to rout them back to Jacksonville, suffering a loss of about 90. Now buried behind me, here at Lake City, are 155, because although they only suffered about 90, they suffered about 1,000 wounded or 1,000 casualties, although the Union number suffered was twice as high as that. Now, I watch a lot of Atun Shea on YouTube, I probably butchered his name, but he made a good point when talking about did the Confederacy have greater generals. And the point that he made was, yes, however, they wanted to make a name for themselves. The Confederacy was seen as more of a romantic thing than a military thing that was made to last. So most of these battles had no real strategic influence. At least this one was waged on February 20th, 1864, towards the end of the war. So they figured that they would like to have their one final stand and, and win the battle at the expense of a great number lost, because 5,000, that was one third of the troops of the Confederacy in Florida. And so you waste a huge number of troops at a horrible cost. I mean, 90 dead and then 155 behind me who later died. That's a huge number of only 15,000 troops. And so this battle had no real long-term effects during the war, but it made the Floridian Confederates feel good. And the war was lost only about a year later. But behind me are buried the the majority of those dead from the battlefield, although presumably a couple of them probably are still out in the swamps somewhere. I mentioned in the past, in a previous video, that Florida was not totally a part of the Confederacy as Virginia was. Florida was often switching back and forth between Confederate and Unions, and the interior of the state 
was majority controlled by Confederates. And because their population was so small, well, that was one of the contributing factors, but because they had such a small population, they couldn't afford to take the entire territory by force as they did in places like Georgia or Virginia or Alabama, especially. Now, only 140,000 people lived in this state and half of them were slaves. And people like the one buried behind me were in the village of Miccosukee. Uh, this is Captain Isham M. Blake, and he commissioned as an officer in the 5th Florida Infantry because he had a very vested interest. He did believe in the cause of the South, but his father was a plantation owner. And Leon County, along with Tallahassee, were actually called Cotton Kingdoms because you had the Union controlling a lot of areas, you had the Confederacy controlling a lot of areas, but a large amount of political pressure was placed upon the plantation owners. These were considered sort of the aristocratic people in Confederate society. And they did consider the areas that they controlled to be essentially kingdoms because the plantation owners, what they said, went. And Isham Blake was the son of one of these plantation owners who settled very initially, one of the first settlers settling the area of central Florida and then moved up to Leon County as it became the so-called Cotton Kingdom of Florida. But around this cemetery, there's an abandoned church and several other very interesting Civil War graves. And they're interesting just for the fact that so few people served in the regular Confederate States Army in Florida. Only 15,000 could be mustered. I'm here now at the grave of Lewis Thornton Powell, and Powell is a fascinating story, and I actually just learned it because kind of taking this trip to the South has been what spurred my interest in the Civil War. I didn't really have much of an interest before I visited back again. But Powell was one of the Abraham Lincoln assassination conspirators, and his story is, now that I read through it, 10 times more interesting than anything I'd ever expected. Now Powell, you see his photos before he was executed, he is a handsome man. He has deep eyes, he has a strong chin, and he's very fit. And you see him sort of looking defiantly at the cameraman, but Powell was born in rural Alabama, and his father was a very religious man. And at a young age, his father became a Baptist preacher and moved to Georgia where he opened up a church and they freed the three slaves that the family owned. Eventually, they had to move to Florida because of some financial problems. And Powell, immediately after the South declared independence in 1861, lied about his age and joined the Confederate Army. Now, he said he was 19 but he immediately became known within his group of soldiers as a really just brutal killer. His officers commended him for shooting only to kill and not to injure, which was a very unpopular thing. The huge majority of soldiers, even today, just shoot to wound. Powell was targeting. He was very, very precise with what he did, and he was very calculated and cold. When he had an enemy in his sights, he would take them out every time. Now, after a year, his term of enlistment ended, but he rejoined. And after some time fighting again, he was sent off to Gettysburg, where he was wounded and taken as a prisoner of war. After a short affair or a short kind of relationship with the nurse at a hospital where he was working, still as a POW, that was his job during the POW period, she gave him possibly a Union Army uniform or just helped him escape. And he went off to Maryland, where he joined Mosby's Rangers. And eventually, he was in this boarding house in Maryland that was very popular with the Confederate Secret Service, the Confederate spy agency, really. And the Confederate Secret Service was a fascinating kind of loose collection of Confederate sympathizing spy groups. It wasn't really centralized into one government department. So there's a big debate over whether or not he joined at this early stage, because with Mosby's Rangers, he kept fighting for about a year after already having spent some time on the run. But around 1863, 1864, he took a trip along with a Union POW who had been sent to destroy Mosby's Rangers back to Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, and he returned just downtrodden, dejected. He was now upset because he saw that the Union cause had died. He was furious the Confederacy, or the, the Confederate cause had died, rather, because he returned back and he saw that they were basically already preparing for a surrender in Richmond. So there is a big 
debate over what happened next. What we know is that he surrendered to Union lines and he took the oath of loyalty to the Union in 1865, but at some point he must have come into contact with John Wilkes Booth. Initially, this would have been spurred on by the Confederate Secret Service, who had assigned him with sort of taking tasks with these Confederate guerrillas, of which he was already a part. And he had been tasked with helping assist the kidnapping plot of Abraham Lincoln. Now that the surrender had been signed, they were going to kidnap Lincoln uh, and another, the Secretary of State, and different various officials in charge of waging war against the South, bring them into Richmond and petition for the release of all Confederate officers, which they hoped would reignite the cause of the South. And eventually, for some reason that I'm still not sure about, John Wilkes Booth began thinking that this was impractical, and so he just shot Lincoln in the back of the head. And he told his conspirators, basically a couple days before, your job is now to kill. It's no longer a kidnapping mission, it's a mission to kill. And so, Lewis Powell uh, was unsuccessful in this, I believe. He didn't manage to go through with it, but they caught him at a boarding house, and they sent him off for a trial and execution. And it's said that he was very, very, you know, determined and straight-faced, but when they brought out the wife of one of the accused to execute her alongside the other three conspirators, including himself, his eyes filled with tears, and he said, she's innocent. She doesn't deserve to be up here. And so they hanged him. Now, for a long time, he was buried within the walls of the military fort in Washington, D.C., where they were hanged. However, after a number of years, they were just kind of cycled around, and in 1991, it was discovered that his skull was in the collection of a doctor who had worked for the Smithsonian, and this was returned to this cemetery just a few years later. 